All right, so a little over a minute till I start the stream here. Well, the stream's already started until I start the content, rather. I see some people early already. It's just going to be me today. There were some scheduling conflicts. If you can hear me okay, do me a favor and let me know in the chat. All right, welcome to this Friday's Cam Hangout. And I'm CJ Abraham. Al Watmo would usually join, but he had a scheduling conflict. Uh, and we also, we were going to cover a, a couple of turning topics this week. But because uh, Al's not on here and the other person that I, I wanted to have on here couldn't join, we're actually going to pivot a little bit and we're going to talk about some soft jaws. Uh, I saw lots of comments um, over the last week about doing soft jaws. It's something that I didn't get to do in the first stream that we did either. So I'm going to take this time on Good Friday to drop some soft jaws. And uh, if uh, there's a delay in the chat, it's about 20 seconds. So if you throw up a question, uh, I can only look so often since it's just me. Al isn't covering questions for me today. So uh, throw up your question. Let me have some time to you know, have it pop up in chat and then I'll try and get to it. So I'm going to use that Gearbox Cam example again because it was working out pretty well. And uh, I already have a soft job template that I can use for that. If you're curious how to set up these templates that I'm going to be using, you can watch either of the other Friday Hangouts that we've done. In the first one, I demonstrate how to use them. In the second one, I demonstrate how to put it together. So. Let's go ahead and hide my face so that you guys can see the whole screen. And you can see I've left this example with the first set of jaws in here. And we're going to pull in soft jaws as if we had already completed the first stop and everything and just pull in the soft jaws and start from there. So I'm going to hide that. I'm going to insert into current design my soft jaw template. Okay. And this top side of the gearbox is the one that we've already done. So if I flip over my view a bit, the part's oriented correctly. So I want the soft jaws to be oriented according to the part orientation. Okay, so I've got my part relatively close and I'm ready to drop it in so that I can add joints. So I'll hit OK and I get what we call the, the one free move. And I'm going to apply a joint between the joint origin that I have on the template and a joint origin on the part. And there's a few options that I can do here. So I can first select the joint origin here. And I don't really have any good joint origin options on the bottom of the part. And there is a trick to getting what I would call the centroid of the part that I showed in the, in the last cam hangout where you can uh, you can project the silhouette of the part onto a plane, patch that with a surface, and then you can use that whole surface as uh, a way to get a joint origin. But I can also just take this top face, and if I hold control, I can then get this joint origin right here. This is the one that I want. Okay, and I'm going to flip some things around to make sure that the jaw is in the right orientation. That's good. If I hit OK, now the template is locked to the part. We're going to make some adjustments here, but I'm going to flip through the, the comments real quick here just to make sure I haven't missed anything yet. 
<laughs> what could Al possibly be doing that's more important? I don't know. That's his business. All right, excellent. No questions yet. So right now the part is buried in those jaws, and I don't need the part to go all the way in them. So I'm going to edit my joint again. And I can drag on these arrows to displace the jaws some distance. And because I set that joint to the top of the part, whatever distance I put in here will be the distance between the top of the part and the top of the jaw. So I could put in minus 250 thousandths. And now the part is sitting above those jaws, 250 thousandths. I can change the visual style to wireframe. I can check to make sure that none of the hardware that is holding the soft jaws to the vise are going to interfere with the part. Looks like everything's okay. And what else do I want to do here? Maybe I want to modify the spacing between the jaws. Maybe I have a certain set of parallels that I want to use or something like that. Uh, right now, because I haven't broken the link yet, I can't use the parameter that was associated with those jaws. So if I break the link, the parameters that I used inside of that template will get carried over to this document now. And I have a parameter called jaw spacing. And this could be whatever we want it to be. So maybe three quarter inch. And what you'll notice is that sometimes when you set up these templates, because of the way things get calculated, uh, some things might not uh, immediately calculate correctly. And if that's the case, you want to go to modify and choose compute all. And there's a little shift that you almost missed it, but uh, it r went through the calculations of the uh, all of the features again and made sure everything was as I intended it. And we can go through here again. I can make a, a much more dramatic change here, so a quarter inch. And here you can definitely see that um, the part is not centered inside of those jaws. But if I go to compute all, it gets recentered because it recalculates everything. So that's one thing you want to look out for is that if if you intended for the model to be up a certain way, set up a certain way and it didn't quite did what you want, didn't quite do what you want, need to work on my speaking. Compute all and it should snap back into place. Okay, so I, I see a good question here. Which move is first, part to jaws or jaws to part? It depends on one, uh, which parts are fixed in space. So in this example, let's roll back to feature tree here, or the feature history. So when I drop the gearbox component into this document, it's free floating. Okay, and I can revert back to position to go back to where it was. And then I put in an as-built joint, a rigid as-built joint between the component and the top level assembly. That's another tip that I went over in one of the cam hangouts. And that's to fix the part in place. And we had some other features there for the other vise. And now we have this vise here, which I've inserted. And because I haven't added a joint yet, or at least it's, um, it hasn't calculated yet, this is free floating, okay? So if I had a joint between the component and the vise, no matter what, the vise is going to snap to the component. However, if I create a new joint and I select a joint origin on the component first, the preview will move the part to the vise, okay? So when you're creating a joint, the first joint that you select, that component moves to the next one that you select, regardless of whatever the calculator result is. So again, choose joint, choose the joint on my first component, choose the joint on my second. The first component will move, but when I hit OK, everything snaps back into place. And I'm going to delete this joint because it's not what I wanted. And I can reapply the next joint. Oh, what happened there? Maybe a compute all. There we go. So I hit compute all and it all snapped back into place. 
I hope that answered your question. And I don't see any other ones I need to address right now. If I miss your question, put it in again and I might, I might catch it. Okay, so now that everything's positioned correctly, the next thing I want to do is start cutting geometry out of those jaws. And there's a few ways that we can do that. I'll show you all the tools that we have. And I'm going to hide the data panel here so we have more room. So the first most obvious way to get material out of those jaws is to use the combine tool. And with the combine tool, I can set a target body and a tool body, which in this case will be the part. And I want to cut. So this will remove the common areas from the target body, in this case, the, the jaw. And I want to keep the tools. And what that means is that I'm not deleting the body of the part. I'm just using it as a tool to do this Boolean subtract. Okay, now I click OK. And it doesn't look like much happened, but if I hide the part, you see there was a Boolean subtract from that jaw for all the intersecting geometry. Okay, and I can repeat that. So if I right click, the top feature is always the last command to be used. So I'll repeat combine. Target body will be the back jaw this time. Choose the tool body as the part, keep tools. Okay, so I've done all those subtracts and that's one way to get a start, right? There's still a lot of work to be done here because I have to go through and remove all this geometry that might be floating or uh, parts that are still connected to the jaws and otherwise. So there's lots of other modeling tools we can use to do that. Uh, before we go down that route, the other option that you have here is to simply start with a sketch and what you can do is start a sketch. When you start a sketch, it projects the face that you started the sketch on. So from here, I can immediately hit extrude and I can start selecting the profile. Okay, so now I've got a profile that I could extrude into these jaws. And if I show the part, What you'll see is that this cut feature is also cutting through the part. This would result in a complete cut through all the geometry that is shown. But if I expand objects to cut, you'll see that there's three objects here currently. One of them is the gearbox. So I'm going to uncheck that and it won't include the gearbox in the cut feature. And then I can also say that instead of a specified distance, I can select a feature on the part to go up to. So I can say extent to object. I can select this face on the part and you'll see it only goes down to where that face is. And now I have a profile cut out of there. So that's that's another way to do it immediate with, immediately with a sketch, but you'll notice that uh, like this area in here, this is not supported. So we can go back in there and add geometry. So I just showed you two ways to start. There's there's multiple ways that you can you can tackle soft jaws. And I want to continue down the Boolean subtract route. And so I'm going to delete the sketch and the extrude. Send the, forward, send the timeline forward again. And start from here. OK. So I know it's a little hard to see, but if I select the face right here, that face, if I extrude that face all the way through, Let's do a cut. See, just selecting the face, I didn't even have to start a sketch really, but if I select that face and hit extrude, that will remove all of that material. I believe I can also click that face. Nope, just one at a time, which is okay. So I'm going to cut up to that face right there. That looks pretty good to me. On this face right here, I'm going to start a sketch. And actually, I take that back. Let's use this opportunity to uh, make a parametric, uh, a feature that's more geared towards being parametric. Because if I simply just start a sketch on this face right here, and let's say down the road, I needed to expand the jaws out. So right now, they're 
I don't know what I said it to, three quarters of an inch. Maybe let's say for some reason I need it to be an inch wide or an inch and a half wide. This feature might not even be there anymore because that boss is only an inch and a half in diameter, right? So if I had these jaws spaced more than an inch and a half in diameter, those features would actually fail. So what I'm going to do is I'll start a sketch on this face because I know it's always going to be there. I'm going to project a feature off the gearbox. Okay, so I'll project that feature right there. I'm going to offset it because I know in my soft jaws that I don't want to actually be contacting that part. So a 15th thou offset is probably plenty. Okay, show my soft jaws again. And now I'm going to extrude this feature. So select the profile of the first circle and the offset. Drag that down. And this gets me a pretty good preview of where I'm going with that. So that's nice. And I'm going to make sure that the gearbox is not included in this cut. I'm going to say to object, and I'm going to select the bottom face of the gearbox. So if I hide the, the jaws again here, I'm selecting that bottom face as the target for that extrude. And I'm going to offset that again by additional 15 thousandths. You can put it in whatever number here you want, but again, this is just clearance so that the soft jaws aren't actually contacting this feature on the part. Okay, so far so good. On this side, it looks like I can do mostly the same thing. So I can select that face, and this time, uh, this edge isn't completely taken away there. So when I start this sketch, I'm going to draw a line from this point to this point. And that should give me a profile that I can select. So I'm going to select that profile and I want this profile in here. That gives me that option. Perfect. And I should be able to say to object. And there we go. So far so good. I'm going to take this moment to look through the chat, look for some questions here. Okay, I don't see any questions yet. Any jokes? Any good jokes? Unfortunately, I don't have Al to make some banter with me. That's, that's what I usually like to do. I don't like to just be talking to a screen. Okay, so now I want to do this step up here. This step is supporting that shelf on the other side of the part, so I want to leave this feature in. And it looks like there isn't any geometry that's blocking the profile from being extruded. So I'm going to hit E on my keyboard, drag that through. I see one profile missing here, which is that hole right there, so I can select that guy. Oh, it looks like I can't. Oh, okay, I see what's going on there. So instead of just going direct to extrude, I am going to start a sketch. Because if I start a sketch, that profile should be available to me. And it is. And I'll say two objects, select the top of the jaw. OK, that's pretty good. I would say that the soft jaws now have no conflicting geometry. So I would be able to pull the part up and down, but I wouldn't be able to open the jaws necessarily because there could be undercuts. So for example, this area in here, if I tried to open the jaws right now, I believe that arc is actually an undercut. So you wouldn't be able to, oh, this is definitely an undercut right here. Uh, if we had some mold tools, we, we can make a parting line and see that. But basically right now, you can't nicely open and close these jaws. So we can go through and start using the modeling tools to modify the jaws so that they are nice for inserting and removing the part. And it looks like I see a question here. When all this is done, can you please expand the soft jaws to see the parametric work recalc? Yes. Yes, we can do that. Uh, I'm 
I'm trying my best to set this up so that it doesn't mess up when I start changing the width of the jaws, but we'll see. We can always uh, make, usually when you make parametric changes, you can see what's been missed and you can modify the feature history so that it, it, it doesn't do that the next time, but you can't always catch that in process. Sometimes you have to go back. Uh, I see some questions here. Why didn't you use delete? Can we delete it? Uh, delete actually works super well. Uh, I'm actually a huge fan of the delete tool, but in this instance, in this particular case, it was easier for me to just use extrude cuts because I can select faces and get rid of all the stuff that I wanted just with one extrude. Um, and in some cases, uh, it would be better to use delete. Um, and one case where delete isn't good is where if I parametrically updated something earlier and the feature goes away on its own. For, so for example, let's go ahead and change the width of the jaws here to 1.75. And let's compute all. Okay. So this is a pretty good example where actually my extrude uh, sketch failed. On this side, you can see that the hole went away completely. It doesn't even exist anymore. Huh. You guys got me. So maybe there's a range in which it doesn't work. Let's go back to, let's try one inch. Hmm. Yeah, so stuff like this. Right? If you get faces that kind of appear and disappear and things like that, those can cause parametrics to fail. And you'll have to go back and modify things anyway. So what do we do here? See, so like that one worked fine. Ah, see this one missed an object here. There's a new object, so that has to get cut. I suspect this is a new, yeah, so this is a new object, so that has to be included in the extrude. And I suspect, suspect that one fails because it wasn't included as... Yeah, so now there has to be a line between those two. So that's exactly what I meant when sometimes parametrics can mess you up. All right. But at least we're back where we started. That didn't take long. Okay, so where I was going with this is I want to start making this better for actually holding a part. So all of these uh, fillets in here, all these internal fillets, we need, want to make those bigger. So for example, the radius on one of these is, looks like 3 16 And I want to be able to finish this whole thing with a half inch tool. So I want to blow out those radii. And also all of these internal fillets and they're, they're external on the soft jaws, but they're internal on the part. These all become pitch, pinch points. And so I like to get rid of those and make them bigger so that only faces like these are the ones that are holding the part in. So let's start going through that and see what it would look like. Uh, I will start off by deleting all of these fillets. In this case, I will use the delete tool. Yeah, let's get rid of that one too. And I could do this all in one feature, but I've already done that. Okay, so now I've got something like that. Uh, what I want to do next is start a sketch. And I'm going to project these faces over here because this is the face that I've selected to start the sketch on. All of these arcs are already projected, but I have to reproject these ones over here because they weren't on the face that I selected. And I'm going to add a 
bunch of circles here. And these are the ones that I can use to cut to make these fillets bigger. I'm going to select all of them. So I'm control selecting each one. Okay, I made them equal, so now they should be all equal. And if I drag one of them, they should all update, which they do. And I want this to be at least half an inch in diameter. So I'll go, let's say, 5 eighths. Okay. And I'm going to start an extrude. And I need to extrude this one differently because I need it to go to this shelf instead of all the way to the bottom. So I'll do all of these ones in their own extrude. Okay, and I'll say two object there. And the two jaws are even here. It goes to the same face on the part, so I don't need to break those out into separate extrudes either. Okay, so there's one there. And I'm going to show that sketch again. Do the same thing there. Okay, so those are all of the fillets there expanded to be bigger. And then I'm going to go back and add in fillets and all of these guys. And I can just see right now I missed an area in here on the shelf, but we can go back and fix that. So all of these fillets here, and we'll do the ones over here too. Okay, all those guys, we want those to be big. Let's hide the, uh, show the part in here so you can see what I'm talking about here. But you can see if I make them small, I mean, small is okay here, but if they're big, we get some clearance on the part here. And that looks pretty ideal to me. Being careful about this area in here. Okay, I like that. So let's leave it at 3 eighths. And let's fix this area in here. Now, what happens if I, did, if I delete these? Let's just... Let's see what happens. Hey, I actually really like that. I'm going to leave that as is. Okay. Great, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to look through chat, see if there's any questions. Can you put toolpath on purple geometry? You can. So any geometry that you see in a sketch, you can apply a toolpath to. You just have to select it. So, for example, in 2D contour. In fact, we're gonna we're gonna do something like that in just a minute. I'm gonna I'm gonna program these soft jaws. There's some tricks for soft jaws that I like to do. Uh, yep. So I see some other people here answering questions for me, which is great. Have you considered drafting angle on fillets? No, I have not. Uh, I'm curious what you mean by that. Uh, feel free to reach out to me like on Instagram or something or find some method of contacting me. I should probably cover that. Anyway, let's move on to cutting this part. So first thing we do is save. Huh. And we go over to manufacturer, start our setup. And this you set up just like any other part you would do. And it's actually good to use the same settings you would use on here um, for both cutting the soft jaws and cutting the part when it's in the soft jaws. So I'll select my Z and X orientation. I like to use features on the vise, so that's going to be my Z normal. That's going to be my X normal. Origin, again, selected point. We go through to the template. And I select the origin out of the template. That way it's on the bottom center. In fact, I, do, I don't show the table in any of the demos that I do. But whenever I'm working at a machine, the table has been, um, the work offsets have been calibrated to the table. And that's why I always put them in the bottom center of the vise like this, which is great for zero point clamping systems. 
The model in this case is gonna be these two jaws. So I'll just select those two bodies and you'll see the stock preview just goes in between them like that, which is great, that's fine. I'm going to set the stock mode to no additional stock and program number, name, WCS number are kind of irrelevant because I'm not going to take this out to a machine. Okay, so there's our setup. And you notice something's got hid automatically. That's because I have this setting down here uh, enabled, which it looks like it's cropped on the preview there. But we have these checkbox for sync view with active setup and sync visibility with active setup. So when you have the sync visibility checkbox turned on, uh, when you're switching between setups, it'll show and hide the bodies that are or are not in that setup. So model, stock, fixture stuff. I think it's pretty handy. So anyway, let's start off with, we can do some 2D adaptive clearings. And I set the spacing between the jaws here to be one inch. So we could definitely stick a half inch tool in there and start using a 2D adaptive clearing. Uh, I think I actually have the gearbox tools in here. Perfect, my favorite half inch end mill. And I'm going to select the faces from bottom to top and you'll see why in a second. So I'll select that face, that face, and that face. Set the optimal load to 50 thousandths just to have a nice looking tool path. Okay, and here is why I did that. Uh, the stock simulation won't be correct because I have the stock going in between the two parts like that. So for the sake of just having a nice simulation, I remove the other body for now. But we get something like this. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. And I'm going to add that other body back in. And let's see here. If I, if we are soft jaw. There we go. Okay. And I'm going to control D with this toolpath highlighted to duplicate that toolpath. All right, so now I have two of the same path here and I'm going to right click edit clear those selections and then select the bottom face there and the next one up there all right and now our soft jaws are completely roughed And this is where I want to get into something that um, is a little bit more advanced because in some cases when programmers have the jaws not spaced as far apart as I have them here. Right now I have them one inch apart, but let's say that they were spaced 600 thou apart. Uh, you might have a tough time because the tool may want to plunge, especially if you've got it open like this, it may want to plunge on the other jaw because it's trying to set clearance uh, from the entry point here. So what you can do is you can start a sketch, right? And I'm going to project that edge. Didn't quite do what I wanted it to there. Okay, so I'm gonna project that edge and I'm gonna make a couple of lines here. And note that I'm making these lines tangent on either side. And I'm going to space this line some distance from this other jaw here. So I'm going to project one of the edges from that jaw, specify a distance like, let's say, 50, 50 thousandths is plenty. Okay. And now I have geometry that I can use as a closed pocket as opposed to an open pocket. And what this allows me to do is that you'll have to separate out each toolpath one by one, unfortunately, when you're using this method. But you'll be able to select the sketch as the pocket. And then you would get a result that looks like this. So it'll be ramping in. 
But if there is enough clearance between the two jaws and it doesn't have to ramp in, if you have stock contours enabled and you select that as the stock contour, so it's it's overlapped by the, the blue lines right now, but if you have that selected as the stock and you have your pocket selected, it will enter from the outside if it can. So this will automatically switch between uh, ramping and plunging if it has the opportunity to. And I'll do that one more time for this shelf up here so you could see what that looks like because I think that uh, that gets some people out of pickles pretty quickly. So I'll create a sketch. I'm hitting P on my keyboard for project and I'm going to project all of these edges. I don't want to project the face because if I project the face, it gives me all of the edges and then I can't delete just these ones, unfortunately, I don't think. I've tried that before and it didn't work great. Oh, look at that, it worked fine. Even I learned something on these Hangouts. Okay, so I've got my lines there. That one uh, came off tangent because I was able to um, automatically get that tangent relationship, but when I came off the other side for this line, it didn't, so I have to add in that tangent relationship there. I'm going to do another dimension to that other line. Oh, I need to project it. So I'll hide the first sketch, project the other one. And once I get this one done, I'll stop for questions. See if there's any that I miss, because I've gone a long time without checking the chat. Okay, so there's my pocket profile. And I'm gonna edit the last one that I used there. So my stock contour is this. My pocket selection is this. Right, and we get that result again. So if the jaws were spaced closer together, let's go ahead and try that and see if we break the parametrics again. So instead of one inch, let's do, let's do 450 thousandths. Okay, so one side of my jaws, the one that we're programming <laughs> didn't break, but some of the other ones did, but that's okay. At least I can demonstrate now that when I go back in here and regenerate this toolpath, it should give me a ramp in instead of a Drop, oh, so it had space. I'm getting a weird highlight there, but it had space where the previous one, where the previous toolpath went. So it was still smart enough to know that it didn't have the plunge. So let's include that this time. Okay, so now I've got that stock profile going over that hole. So now it should ramp. So in this case, the software was smarter than me. It knew what I wanted before I even knew what was gonna happen. All right, let's go back and set this to one inch. And let's do a compute all. Okay, and I see some bodies in here again that didn't get included. So I'm gonna have to go back in and make sure that So objects to cut, yep, need to include that one. That one's already good. Let's see, was it this one? Yeah, okay, objects to cut. Make sure that one gets included. Okay, we're all good again. Okay, question time. Let me get through the chat here. Uh, even on normal projected edges. Yeah, so all projections, you actually saw, I was selecting projections here as selections for my toolpath. So yes, any projections you should be able to use for a toolpath. Uh, why not select the bottom of one jaw as the stock? That would actually work, that would work fine. So the reason I didn't in this case is because I am roughing these steps in order. So once I rough this step, this material is gone. So when I do this step, this area has gone away and that's actually room for where the tool can plunge. So that's okay. And same thing for up here. So if I delete 
this toolpath down because we're not using that anymore. We would get this result, uh, same as before, but it would ramp where it has to, which is kind of nice. Uh, can you simulate this quickly to show what the stock looks like? Yes, I can simulate this. But I do have to go back and modify my selection so that the stock is just over this jaw. Okay, use the same adaptive for both instead of two different adaptives. Is it easier to use project for the extrude instead of combine? It leaves you details that you don't need. Um, I will say that using, uh, as I said earlier, using combine to start or using uh, sketches to start, I would say you have to figure that out on a case-by-case -case basis. On some cases, it's easier. On some cases, it's not. Um, in this case, I wanted to show both. If I were doing this in real life, I would start with the sketches because there's only three steps here on this part. And then it would always be parametric. But I wanted to show the combined method to demonstrate other methods of doing this, right? This, this is supposed to be advanced content. Maybe I should have used the more advanced part. Uh, I see another one coming here. If you create a surface between the two soft jaws, couldn't you make both soft jaws on the second level in one step? Yes, yes you could. So uh, if instead of having space between the two jaws, if it was just a, a, a one piece jaw with a pocket cut out of the middle, yes, you absolutely could. That is, that is a good comment. Uh, I like to include the spacing because then I can go in and start uh, chamfering things. So actually, let's, let's do the finishing toolpaths first. Okay, so I'll put in my 2D pocket at a finishing pass. And again, I'm going through these fast, not because I'm demonstrating picks and clicks, I'm just demonstrating ideas here. Um, there's plenty of content for picks and clicks if that's what you're interested in. And I need to include the rear jaw, okay. Duplicate that pocket. Click, click. Okay, so these toolpaths rough and finish everything there, and I want to chamfer. And if I had no space between these jaws, I wouldn't be able to chamfer. But if I go to 2D chamfer, select the chamfer tool, um, this one should work fine. It's got a flat tip on it. Yeah, that's actually a really nice tool. Uh, you can select edges like this, Okay, and actually this top one, I don't want to go around the whole jaw. I just want to put a chamfer where we've cut. So I'll go to the first edge and I'm holding the Alt key. And that gives me one edge selection instead of the whole contour. You can see it gives me the whole contour. If I hold Alt, it's just going to be one. And I'll click that again. And then I'll click where I want the contour selection to end. Okay, so I get that. Click the green checkbox and there's my contour. Do the same thing on the other side here. Hold Alt, get my selection, okay. And this gives me a way to chamfer these edges with the chamfer toolpath because then we get to use this chamfer clearance option. And I don't remember which distance I like to use for this tool. Let's just type in 50,000 and see what I get. But basically you have to come up with some distance to drop the tool off the side of the chamfer so that it now it's saying there's a crash but there's not it's just because there's material in here that I technically haven't removed so that looks pretty good I want it to get as close to the top edge as possible because that gets it as close to the end of the edge as possible so that's actually pretty good there in fact, if I go in here and show this, see, I can specify in the toolpath the distance between this wall and the tool shank. 
and that gets applied to all the other edges, regardless of the angle of the wall and things like that. So that's a really nice toolpath to use. And that's how I would make soft jaws for this part. Uh, let's start showing things. Can I show all bodies and components? I sure can, and then I'll hide that guy. Good. And then I would start, I'm not gonna program the second setup for this part in this Hangout, but uh, if I were going to, I would just duplicate that setup, and now I have all the same settings, and instead of the model being the soft draws, I would select the part, maybe select the solid for the stock that I need here, which is in the first template. Okay, and now I have setup two. So once you have the setup for the soft draws, creating your second setup for the part itself is actually really not that hard. You have all the same settings there already. And here I go, more questions. I'm gonna show my face now too, so you can see my beautiful face while I look through your questions. Uh, if you create an imp, do you finish the 3D contours of the jaw? Okay, yeah, so I addressed this one already, but someone asked if I use 2D contours or 2D pockets to finish, I do. Um, 2D adaptive is not recommended for finishing because uh, it is still based off the 3D toolpath algorithm. And so you might get really micro um, uh, variance in something like the Z height, where you set the Z height to be a specific level on the bottom of the jaws. So for example, you go in here and you select a, a 2D adaptive for this face right here. And let's say that that face ends up being, I can measure it actually. So that face to the bottom of this guy is some distance. Let's try that again. So it's this number right here, right? So that's actually a whole long list of numbers. But basically it's 4.256889. It would get rounded off to four digits. But uh, the kernel might return a Z level that is a few tenths above or below that. Uh, whereas a 2D contour uses the absolute numbers. So actually it's always better to finish with a 2D contour or 2D pocket rather than try to finish with a 2D adaptive. That's my recommendation is to not finish with 2D adaptive. Uh, Peter says, don't forget to thumbs up if you like the stream. Yes, please thumbs up. Please comment too. Uh, this topic covering soft jaws is actually, um, it came from the comments. Right? I was looking over comments, people were giving feedback to me. So if you want to see a specific topic, please put it in the comments. Uh, if, you know, it's, feedback is good everywhere. Let's get through more questions here. Okay, it looks like there's not really any more questions, but there's, there's lots of conversation going on here. Uh, we're actually kind of nearing the top of the hour. Um, if somebody can put in chat something else that they might want to see that I didn't cover, go ahead. It'll take uh, probably 30 seconds before I actually get to see it. But um, if anybody has any other topics they want to, they want me to talk about regarding soft jaws. Show the part in here again. Let me mess around with the parametrics a little bit. At least if I make micro changes, like I was like, oh, I, I have uh, instead of a hundred one inch, I have uh, I'm missing a parallel, so maybe I only get eight seventy five. Okay, yeah, so I got the body in there again. So that would be solved by using sketches in Extrude rather than trying to do Boolean subtracts. And actually, the ultimate soft draw tool, in my opinion, would be, be to have a solid sweep. So I would be able to take this part, select it as a tool, and do a solid sweep out of the jaw. That would be, I'm going to push for that. If you guys want solid sweep for soft jaws, and I, I'm sorry, if you want solid sweep as a modeling tool that you can use to make your soft jaws, please let, let us know in chat.
All right, I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to go ahead and end the chat. Thank you, everybody, for coming, uh, and I'll see you again next week.